How do you have a hard conversation? You love the truth and you love the person. Last week we focused on loving the truth. That if you have a hard discussion based on opinion, that's a dumb thing to have a hard conversation based on. Because the other person can just say, well, that's just your opinion, man. And that'll be the end of it. And if you have a hard discussion based on emotions, well, that's going to be a highly emotional situation. You're not going to get very far. But if you base your hard conversation on truth, on what is real, then you both have to deal with what is real. We talked about what that truth is, that it is God's word, law and gospel. I am a sinner. Jesus has died for me. Now, all of that is absolutely true. It's real. If you're going to have a hard discussion, you, you really need to be loving the truth. But you also need to love the person. You ever have a discussion with a Christian <coughs> who loves theology more than they love you? It is a problem. Because they might be absolutely right, but they're being a total jerk about it. Which means even if you agree that they're right, you're probably not going to agree with them because they're being a jerk. And if you really love the person, that's why you're speaking the truth to them. Well, what does that look like? If you're going to love the person, I mean, first question should be, why should we? Well, the simple reason why we should love the person is that God commands us to. You heard this just a little bit ago. It was our first lesson from Leviticus. Do not pervert justice. Do not show partiality to the poor or favoritism to the great. But judge your neighbor fairly. Don't go about spreading slander among your people. Don't do anything that endangers your neighbor's life. I am the Lord. Do not hate your brother in your heart. Rebuke your neighbor frankly so you will not share his guilt. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against one of your people. But love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So we're going to talk about Leviticus. We need to be really honest about Leviticus. If you're one of those Christians that has ever said, this year, as my New Year's resolution, I'm going to read the Bible, Leviticus is probably where you've stopped. You may start at the beginning of the Bible. You start with Genesis, and if you've been a Christian your whole life, you might get some stuff that's really familiar in there. God creates the world. There's Adam and Eve. Here's Noah. Here's Abraham and his faith. Here's Joseph getting sold by his brothers into slavery, and God uses that to bless the whole world. And you go, okay, yeah, I got this. There's some weird stuff in there as an adult. Maybe I'm reading some stuff for the first time, and I go, okay, well, this is kind of neat. And then you keep on going. You get to Exodus, and here is God leading his people out of slavery in Egypt. And you go, oh, yeah, I saw a movie about this. And then you get to Leviticus, and it's a bunch of rules. And you get to it one day, and you go, you know what? I'll read this one tomorrow. Maybe the day after that. Maybe next month. And then you get to next December, and you go, oh, I didn't get very far. Leviticus is one of those books that really is hard to read. Um, it's one of those books that it's much more helpful if you read with a mature Christian or you get a good uh, a commentary like the People's Bible to read with it. Um, the podcast Two Steps Forward did a great Bible study on Leviticus. If any of you are interested in that or if you want to go through the Bible, um, great podcast to listen to. They did a really good job through that book in particular. But it's really important if you get to Leviticus to remember where it is. God has just freed his people from slavery. And it did not start with God showing up in Egypt going, okay, people of Israel, if you want me to free you from slavery, you need to behave. That's not what God does. He just shows up and he frees his people. He fights for them. He leads them across the Red Sea on dry land. And then he leads them to the mountain of, of Mount Sinai. And then God says, I have freed you. You're my people. Now this is how you will behave. It's really, really important to remember that placement. God does not give his laws to say, this is how you get me to love you. He just loves you. He's already freed you. Jesus has already died for your sins. Those sins are real. Jesus really died for them. Then he says, now this is how you act. Repeated through Leviticus, if you, if you read through it, you'll get this phrase. You'll see it twice in ours. It says, I am the Lord. And when you hear that just, just out loud, you kind of go, oh, God's saying he's the boss and I better listen. And that is part of it. 
But you'll notice it's Lord in all capitals. That's God's special name. You might know it as Yahweh or Jehovah. That's actually the same word trying to be translated into English. That's the name for the God who makes and keeps all his promises. It's the God who says, I am your God. I have rescued you. So when he says that, he's not saying, I'm the boss. He's saying, I love you. And that's why I'm telling you these things. I've already rescued you. And now this is how I want you to live. So all this is based on what God has already done. And then God says, love your neighbor. He says, don't do anything that endangers your neighbor's life. I'm the Lord. Oh, by the way, as much as I love you, I love your neighbor. So watch out for their life too. Don't seek revenge or bear a grudge against one of your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I'm the Lord. As much as I love you, I love your neighbor. So love them that way too. And that passage caused so much argument. So who's my neighbor? And rabbis argued about this for centuries. Who's your neighbor? Well, he's whoever lives within 100 feet of your house. Well, he's whoever is in your village. Well, he's whoever is Jewish, wherever they live. And they would argue back and forth and back and forth. Who's my neighbor? And to the point that Jesus was actually asked this. Rabbi goes up to Jesus, teacher of the law, and says, Okay, Jesus, who's my neighbor then? And Jesus says, the parable of the Good Samaritan. Guy's walking down from Jerusalem to Jericho. He gets jumped by a bunch of thugs. He's beaten, left for dead. And a Samaritan comes and helps him. Yeah, I, I'm summing up here. You can read it all on your own. But that was fighting words. That would be kind of like going today to the Giza Strip and saying, you know, you should really treat those Jews nicely. And going to Jerusalem and going and saying, you know, those Palestinians, they're your neighbors. You should treat them nicely. You think that's going to go, go real well today if you do that? Samaritans and Jews hated each other. And then Jesus gives the story where a Samaritan shows up, and he's the guy that shows love to the Jewish guy. And the Samaritan doesn't start by saying, have you behaved? He doesn't start by saying, I want to tell you a nine-point plan for salvation, and if you agree to it, then I'll show you love. He starts by just showing love. He leads with love. He takes care of the guy. And in Jesus' telling of the, the account, I don't know if the guy ever wakes up before the Samaritan leaves him in the care of another person. He leads with love. If you're having a hard discussion, if you're planning to have a hard discussion, you need to love that person. Because here is a person that Jesus loves. And if Jesus loves that person, I want to love him too. Uh, one more thing I want to point out here that's kind of cool. It says, don't show favoritism. Don't show partiality to the poor or favoritism to the great, but judge your neighbor fairly. That's kind of crazy. I don't want to show favoritism to a rich person. I'm not going to treat them better if they're rich. Now, growing up in the 80s and 90s, that got ground into me. In almost every single movie, the rich person was the jerk. And in those movies, usually the poor and the homeless person, those were the smart ones. You get the bird lady in Home Alone 2. You get... Um, the bird lady also in Mary Poppins, feed the birds. You know, she's the smart one, right? And Jesus, no, don't show favoritism to the poor people either. Love them enough that they're equal. Then he continues, don't hate your brother in your heart. Rebuke your neighbor frankly so you won't share in his guilt. Now, if you read this in your paper Bibles, it almost looks like poetry. And it's not poetry, but it gets kind of close to it. And the interesting thing about Jewish poetry is that it's always two lines, and the two lines always explain each other. Those of you who took part in our Psalms Bible study last year, hopefully that rings a bell a little bit. It's one of the ways that you can tell if this is weird, you go to the other phrase and go, oh, I get it now, because they'll go together. Don't hate your brother in your heart. Rebuke your neighbor frankly. They go together. Rebuking means calling someone out. This is a thing that has to stop. And according to the Bible, if you know someone is doing something wrong and you don't say this has to stop, you hate them. Which is not the way our world works. 
The way our world works, if you call someone out, obviously that means you must hate them. But God has a very different message. But I think you get it. If you know someone is hurting themselves, if you know someone is self-harming, and you say, well, that's fine, you just do you, you understand that that is not a good thing to do. If you know someone is self-harming, you want to get them help. And maybe you're not the person to get them the help, but you're trying to connect them with the people who can help them. You get that physically. At least I hope so. But God says when you sin, you're actually hurting yourself. You're walking away from God. And so if you know someone is living in sin or has made a habit of a sin, and you know that, and you don't call them out, you're letting them walk away from God. And you're saying, oh, have fun in hell. We'll see you later. And you walk on your merry way to heaven. That's not loving. That is not loving the person. So you need to have that hard discussion. But I want to encourage you. Having the hard discussion is showing love. We heard this in 1 Corinthians 13. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. If you love the person, you need to speak the truth to them. Now, practically speaking, how do we do that? I want to preface this by saying it ain't easy. I know this from personal experience. It is not easy. If you walk away from today's sermon with only two things, I want it to be these two. Love the truth, love the person. If you get that, you've got the principle. Now, how do you live that out? Begin by loving the truth. Start by praying. Praying that God show you the truth. Pray for the other person, because they're going to have to deal with you. And you are not always an easy person to deal with. Again, I speak from experience. <laughs> Pray for you, that God gives you wisdom and courage to actually have this discussion, because it is hard and it is scary. And once you've done praying, please don't open, please open up your Bible and make sure that you are actually having a discussion based on truth. It is so easy to think our opinions are the way it is. It is so easy to say, well, clearly everyone knows that, without even realizing you're doing it. So open up your Bible first and see, is this actually the truth? Or am I having an opinion? And if you don't know where to go in the Bible, Google is your friend. I, I know you don't hear that from a pastor too often, but seriously, just Google. What does the Bible say about anger? A list of verses are going to pop up there, and you can read those verses. If you don't trust Google, and I get that too, hello, I'm your pastor. Text me, call me, get together. Let, let's see, and I, I, hopefully I can send you some verses. If I don't respond, maybe I'm being a dip, go ahead, text again. It's okay. I, I will not be offended by that. But find the truth. Make sure that, that this hard discussion is worth having and then love the person. Reach out to them and say, hey, can we get together? And one of the ways you show love is by doing this one-on-one. -on -one. Don't get a mob. Please do not show up with torches and pitchforks. Love the person, one-on-one. -on -one. And you start by just listening. It's kind of interesting in, the, in that passage, 1 Corinthians, it does not start, love rejoices in the truth. That's not where it starts. It starts, love is patient, love is kind. So be patient with that person. Ask, hey, I heard about this thing. Can you tell me about it? I've seen that you've been doing this lately. What's going on? And do it to show love, not to beat them down, because that's not the point. Reaching out and just listen, and listen some more, and listen some more. What you might find is that that person is doing that thing, but there's something behind it. And so you don't want to concentrate on behavior modification. Maybe there's something else and you, you need to have that person talk about that thing. Maybe it's a Venn diagram and there's some overlap and you go, okay, there's this thing over here. Let's talk about this. Maybe you find out that you were wrong. This is not what's going on. Hey, praise God. Okay. So just listen and listen some more and listen some more. And being patient means you're going to have that hard discussion. 
but maybe you're not going to have it right away. Especially if that person happens to be a good Christian. And by good, I just mean someone who's a little bit mature. Just by having the discussion, maybe they're going to go, uh-oh, this person knows. Maybe that's all you need to have. It's just, what's going on? And then God's word works in that person's life, and that by itself turns them around. Maybe you were talking for two hours listening to them, and you go, dude, this is really good, but I have to go because I have a job. Can we get together later? It's okay to be patient. Assuming that that person's life is not in immediate danger with what they're doing, still have the hard discussion, but it's okay to be patient. Be kind, but do still speak the truth. You do need to get there, but it doesn't have to be a knee-jerk, okay, sit down, shut up, I'm going to talk to you. Please do not approach people that way. It is not going to help. But love the person. Love the person. Even when they're hard to love. After you have that discussion, continue to show that love. You're going to have a hard discussion. And it's going to be awkward for a little bit, isn't it? Keep on loving that person, even through that awkwardness. Continue to be kind and patient. If they're a friend, keep on being a friend. Let's get together. Let's, let, let's go play Halo or something, whatever you happen to be doing before. If you never played Halo before, maybe don't start that as the lead-in. <laughs> but continue to be their friend. Continue to show that love. And hopefully you have the chance to again speak the truth to them, but don't make that the basis of your relationship. Continue showing that love, even when they're hard to love. Just like you love the truth, even when the truth is not necessarily easy to love. And as I go through all those practical things, I don't know, as an adult, I look at that and go, man, have I failed. Love the truth. There are certain parts of God's word that if I was in charge of God's word, I would not have written. I've been very open about that with some of my friends going, you know what, you ask me why God put that there, I have no clue, but I have to trust that he knows better than me. I've not always loved the person. I've known people that have been sinning and walking away from God. And I've gone, have fun. If I take this seriously, it is very crushing. And if it is for you, I want to remind you that Jesus loves you even when you've been hard to love. We have been very hard to love. Jesus says, do this. And we go, yeah, I don't feel like it. Jesus says, let's get together. And we go, yeah, I'm busy. And Jesus still loves you. He comes to you and says, I died for that sin too. For the times that you failed for the times that you didn't love that person, for the times that you didn't love the truth, I still love you. And I reach out to you and I forgive you. Last week we talked about we are to love the truth and one of the things to remember is Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. The truth still loves us. So go back there. Go back, just like in Leviticus, that this starts with him rescuing us. It starts with him saying, you are mine. And I pray that you take the person there too. If you lay down the law, sometimes that needs to get laid down. But take them to the foot of the cross where that law was nailed, where their sins were nailed to the cross and their sins have been taken away. This is how you have a hard discussion. Love the truth. Love the person. Amen. Let's stand. Now the peace of God that is better than anything we can understand will keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord until he returns to bring you home to life everlasting. Amen. Let's speak a summary of what Christians believe. Today we're going to use the words of the Nicene Creed.